I wonder if another real cold front is going to come in. This one's yeah. just like literally the wind blew it in. <laughs> yeah, it, it's enough to just scatter, <clears throat> excuse me, scatter everything all across the yard and all that kind of good stuff. <laughs> I know. I kind of wish that we, we had raked our leaves so that <laughs> just in piles so the wind could just take them and push them away. <laughs> Yeah, that was something that was going to happen this weekend for us, too. But we'll see what's where they are. They may be all over the place. So. Right. Hello, Lauren. Hi, Rose. Thanks for joining us. We're just going to give everyone a, about a minute or two to join on this lovely Thursday. If you guys want to write where you are uh, watching this from, feel free to do so in the chat. Um, I'm coming to you from way south Austin, and Kim is up north, right, Kim, I think? Yes, yes, <laughs> I'm in a Round Rock area. And a cold front blew in today, that is for sure. <laughs> Well, yeah, I hope you get to watch. Uh, are you here too, Rose? It is so cold today. I don't know where it came from. This morning was so nice. Oh, Dallas, yeah. My parents are in Dallas and my mom is like, Dev, well, long story short, story time before we get started. I was born in New York. And so you'd think they would be used to the cold, but we're definitely not. We just want to go visit, go see some Broadway and stuff. And so when it gets cold here, we're like, no, this is not what we signed up for. <gasps> you, oh, Rose, it's awesome. I'm from Long Island. What part are you from? Are you a Manhattan girl or <laughs> somewhere else? I love New York. I just could not live there again. No way. Oh, there you go. Right in the thick of it. You're brave. Had to walk everywhere. <laughs> All right. Well, let's get started before I keep talking about New York. Now I have, oh man, do I miss some Broadway shows. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. All right, everybody. Welcome. We are here on a Thursday night as part of Care Week, the Center for Relationships Free week of free services. Uh, we are on day five. Uh, thank you for finding us in part two. Thank you, Rose. Um, welcome, George. Uh, thanks for finding us in part two of Care Week. I'm Lizzie, the operations coordinator here at the Center for Relationships, and I'm super excited to welcome you to Positive Psychology in Practice, Ingredients for a Good Life, the free workshop led by Kimberly Flowers. For those of you who are not familiar with us, the Center for Relationships is a community counseling and outreach center based in Austin, Texas, that focuses on relationship therapy, education, provides mental health services to individuals, couples, and groups, and provides educational resources just like this webinar. This is our eighth year of Care Week and our second year of taking Care Week fully virtual. And we love to be able to reach people from all over. So if you are um, not from Austin, we know Rose is from New York and Dallas. <laughs> if you're not from this area, please let us know in the chat uh, where you're from. And before we jump in, just a few housekeeping notes. Uh, Care Week goes until Saturday. So we have our Helping Professionals Day all day tomorrow, and we have some more fun on Saturday as well. Uh, we also have 45 minute free consultations available with a member of our staff to learn more about the center and get some clarity on one or two issues that you would like some uh, feedback on. Lauren is from <laughs> Arizona and Rose is from everywhere. <laughs> it looks like that's awesome. Yeah, my best friend lives in Arizona and it is, I'm very jealous, but I'm not jealous during the summer because no, thank you. Um, Florida is where it's at, you guys. I'm just going to give you a history of all of it <laughs> before we get started. Anyway, all righty. Um, for this webinar, we are mainly going to be interacting through the chat. So please send us a message if there's anything you'd like to say. 
There's also a Q&A feature available at the bottom of your Zoom window if you'd like to um, ask a question or remain anonymous. And uh, no materials are required, but feel free to take notes. Kim is very knowledgeable and I'm actually really looking forward to this presentation. I have not seen it yet. Um, and on that note, I'm going to introduce you to Kim. Kimberly Flowers is a licensed professional counselor associate at the Center for Relationships with a master's in mental health counseling from the Seminary of Southwest. She is Gottman, label, lab, she is Gottman level two trained as well as certified in preparing rich couples, couples assessment. At the center, Kim provides marriage and couples counseling as well as counseling for individuals, making use of CBT and relational cultural awareness and LBTQ and kink friendly methods, multiple relations, multiple, multi, I can't talk this evening. I'm so sorry, you guys. Multicultural relationships, trust recovery, sex therapy, life transitions, and depression and anxiety are among a few of Kim's field of expertise. In her work, Kim believes that acceptance is a key part of meaningful change and self liberation. Um, and on that note, let me see where everyone else is from. Just why not? Awesome. Yeah, if you would um, like to, if anyone needs proof of attendance or anything else, feel free to uh, just chat the host and panelists and we can make uh, your email address and we can make sure we get that to you guys. Um, feel free to post in the chat whenever you want during this presentation and we will, I will stop talking now, Kim. I'm so sorry. <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. Uh, <laughs> And Kim, take it away. Floor All right. Yours. Okay, thank you. Well, welcome, everyone. Good evening. And I hope you all had a great day today. Um, I just want to go over a couple things. I want you to feel free to ask any questions, whether it's in the Q&A or the chat. I am not necessarily manning that at the moment. Lizzie is. But she will kind of, you know, give me an indication just by popping in and say, so-and-so has a question or there is a question. So don't feel like you have to wait to the end, but we definitely will have time to answer questions at the end as well. Um, I want to say a little bit about what I know about positive psychology. Uh, I want to say from my personal opinion, uh, it's great because I love to be positive. I like good vibes and I like uh, to work towards uh, finding a better way to, you know, just feel uh, fulfilled as I go through life. And I think that that's important for us to everyone to kind of do in general in order to be able to just kind of maintain a more homeostatic state while they're going through life and dealing with uh, family and relationships and everyone uh, just in your life in general. So with that being said, uh, we'll go ahead and get started. All right, so what is positive psychology? Well, positive psychology focuses on the positive events and influences in, in life. Um, we will look at uh, positive experiences like happiness and joy, inspiration and love, and positive states and traits like gratitude, resilience, and compassion and positive institutions, which means they're just applying those positive principles within entire organizations and institutions. All right, so the founder of positive psychology is Martin Seligman. He is a research researcher, I'm sorry, with a broad range of experience in psychology. His research in the 60s and 70s laid the foundation for the psychological theory of learned helplessness. And this is one of his famous quotes uh, that talks about that learned helplessness theory. And this theory explains how humans and animals can learn to become helpless and feel they've lost control over what happens to them. So think about a pup, puppy or some sort of pet. I, I, the first thing that comes to my mind is when I see um, a puppy or a dog or something that may have been from uh, an abusive situation, um, you notice that their temperament is a little bit different and they may be a little bit timid or shy or, or they tend to be a little bit afraid uh, to maybe even be pet, 
you know, pet it or, you know, come, come close to people. Um, so when I think about that learned helplessness, that's the thing that kind of comes to mind. Um, so I, I know uh, most of you guys have maybe heard of that before, but um, that just kind of struck me when I started learning about positive psychology that um, it not only affects humans, but animals as well. So Seligman connected this theory with depression, noting that many people suffer, suffering with depression feel helpless. His work opens doors and provided evidence to support many treatments for depressive symptoms, as well as strategies for preventing depression. Seligman felt there was a lot of attention given to mental illness, trauma, and pain and suffering, and hardly any focus on more positive aspects of mental health and well-being. So I want to pause here and um, check in with you, Lizzie, to see if there's a, a question or anything or comment in the chat. Do you know? Not yet. Okay. All right. Perfect. I will continue. All right, so the model that is used for po positive psychology is the theory of well being or the PERMA model. All right, so the PERMA model is, is basically five core elements of the psychological well being and happiness model. Uh, that acronym, like I said, it makes up those five building blocks, and they are you know, positive emotions, engagement relationships, meaning, and achievement. All right, let's look at positive emotion. Positive emotion is more than happiness. Positive emotions include hope, joy, love, compassion, pride, amusement, and gratitude. Increasing positive emotions helps individuals build physical, intellectual, psychological, and, so and social resources that lead to resilience and overall well being. It counters negative emotions and negative physiological effects that are embodied. All right, let's look at some ways to build positive emotions. Sorry, guys, <laughs> getting tongue twisted, tongue tied here. All right, so the first one, spend time with someone you care about. That always lifts me up. I know uh, it really makes my day when I can turn to a friend or a mentor or someone that can kind of encourage me uh, when I'm going through a hard day. So that's one of my kind of go-tos um, when I spend time with a family member that I really feel like that they love to be positive Keyword they're positive because there are some, I do unfortunately have some that um, will just help me stay down if I need to stay. <laughs> they feel like I need to be down, they can bring me down. So try to spend time with people you care about, and that will be that, that kind of encourage you. Um, so do some activities. The second one, do some activities that you enjoy. The third one is listen to music that's uplifting or that's insp inspirational, something that inspires you. I would also add to that, you know, um, if you're a reader or someone who likes poetry, um, reading something inspirational or, you know, maybe reading inspirational poetry um, does it as well. I think that's very um positive and it changes that emotion, whatever it is, if you're feeling down. I know most of you all know uh, some way to find a way to pick you up. So number four, take time to reflect on things that you're grateful for and what's going well in your life. All right, let's look at the E, which is engagement. All right, engagement is what Seligman calls being one with the music or what you probably hear more often is being in the zone. And so in this line with his colleague, um, which his name is kind of hard to say, but it's Dr. Cheek, Min Cheek Sent Me High <laughs> concept of flow. And he's the one that came up with this flow state and it entails the loss of self-consciousness and complete absorption in an activity. So 
So it's kind of like when you just lose yourself. Um, uh, I'm not going to try to assume that I know everybody knows songs or whatever, but there is a song, a rap song in particular that I'm thinking about with Eminem called Lose Yourself. And if everyone who's on here saw the Super Bowl uh, halftime show, that's the song that he kind of performed when he was talking about losing yourself. <laughs> so he's, he was just in the zone and that's what he, you know, kind of, that's what we're talking about when it comes to uh, being in the flow. Um, and and that's, it's, it's almost kind of like losing uh, your self-consciousness is what they call it. Dr. Cheek sent me high, calls it, uh, you know, losing that self-consciousness. You're, you're still conscious, but you're just absorbed in what you're doing. And so he says, people are more likely to experience flow when they use their top character strengths, skills, and attention. Research on engagement has found that people who try to use their strengths in new ways each day for a week were happier and less depressed after six months. All right. So some ways to increase engagement is participate in some activities that you love and where you lose track of time when you do them. You can also practice living in the moment, even when doing mundane daily activities. Um, one of the things that this brings to mind, um, I, I kind of remember is being a little girl and I had to do uh, the dishes. And I really didn't like to do the dishes, but this was kind of weird, but what I would do is with the silverware, um, I would kind of play like the forks were, you know, uh, one particular type of people or or they were the ladies or the men or whatever. And I know the, kni the knives were the men, the forks were the women <laughs> and the spoons were the kids uh, or a store or something like that. So I was kind of weird when I was a little kid, but I lost myself in just doing the mundane thing of washing dishes. <laughs> so uh, I think about that when I when I uh, think about just that engagement and, and losing myself and doing something. Um, another one is spending time in nature, just watching, listening, and observing what happens around you. And identify, learn about your character strengths and do things that you excel in. Lizzie, I want to check in with you and see if there are any questions so far. Yeah, one just popped up. Okay. Uh, I'm curious about how to support a client who has been so low and depressed that they can no longer remember or identify activities that are enjoyable. Mm, that's a good Great question. question. Yeah, yeah. So what I usually do when I have a client that, that seems like they can't really remember the last thing um, that they done or, you know, that kind of brought them any kind of joy or whatever it was, is I, re I really try to start with that day, that particular day. If they can find something to be grateful for, um, some sort of uh, gratitude, you know, and just reminding them that, you know, being able to be connected with you as a therapist or whatever, or with someone, family, and just being able to, to have the conversation about how they're feeling, uh, that in itself is something to be grateful for, because that is kind of like first step of being able to get help and to come out of that. Just recognizing that you are there um, as far as where you are in and of itself is sometimes a good place to start um, to um, acknowledge and, and kind of try and move slowly up from there. I hope that helps. Yeah, the person who asked that question said, great suggestion, starting in the moment or that day and taking it from there. And then we had another question. Uh, why do people remember the negative more than the positive? Well, you know, uh, one of the things about us as humans, I mean, we are intrinsically uh, kind of, we kind of bend towards the negative. Um, think about it in terms of, you know, uh, having a baby or not necessarily having the baby or when we as babies came out, 
um, of the womb. We had clenched fist. We were kind of almost like an angry, you know, crying and different things like that. So the first almost kind of like feeling or emotion that um, babies have when they come out, just think about, you know, that might not have been the best feeling. Um, they, they're crying. It may have been painful coming through the birth canal or even being taken, you know, whether it was C-section or whatever, if there were forceps. And we know that in a sense that, of course, maybe they can't feel pain um, from what I was told, babies, you know, I, I don't know if anyone is a nurse or affiliated with anything in the medical field is that, but I've had a friend that was a nurse and uh, she works uh, with, you know, postpartum and different things in the hospital. And she's like, oh, babies can't feel for the very, you know, first couple of hours. And I was like, I don't know. They come out crying, so they're upset about something. But um, that that's just my thought. But if you think about it, um, we have a natural bend towards the negative. And that's what's always being highlighted. As we go through the day, there could be tons of good things that have happened, but those negative things, they catch our attention and we keep our focus on that. So we have to be intentional about bending towards the positive. Um, and we have to do, we can do that, ex actually do that through what we're saying. We have to pay attention to our words. Um, we can't stop the thoughts from coming, but we can counter those thoughts by what we say. I hope that makes sense. I hope that answered your question. Makes sense to me. Isn't there a, like a phrase for every negative thing said to you, you need 10 positive to undo that one thing or something yeah. along those lines? Yes, and that's absolutely true because we can get stuck in that negative zone. And it's almost like if you think about social media and someone makes a negative comment, a negative comment leaves a negative comment, you can have 20, you know, positives, but that negative is the one we're going to probably go to and, and react from, you know, however we go. It's going to set our whole mood. So we have to be intentional to focus on the good or to turn our thoughts towards the good and counter those thoughts with what we say out of our mouth. Another comment says, uh, the human brain wants to protect itself. Absolutely, you're absolutely right. So when we're in that, down in our lizard brain and we're in that fight, flight or freeze mode, um, we may have to you know, protect ourselves by thinking, I don't wanna go out there. I don't wanna say anything um, because they've already, we've already decided from like I was saying, whether it's comment or someone saying something to us, um, we just kind of take that in because that's what's highlighted and that gives us our reaction most of the time. So. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Um, and then uh, we just have uh, an answer to your question on okay. here. So I'll read, I'll read that if everyone else wants to just chat in the box. Uh, what are some of your favorite things you like to be fully engaged in? Uh, the, we have one here that says drawing, cuddling my cat, being present in with nature, eating delicious food. Um, baking is another one. Um, I personally love to go explore hiking just getting lost in a podcast by myself and just yeah. going for a hike is my favorite thing in the world. Yeah, those are all great, all great. I myself, I love to watch movies and I love to get into, you know, a good movie that's a, maybe a sci-fi or mystery. And I think I spend most of my time talking through the whole movie because I'm trying to figure it out and I kind of lose <laughs> I really get lost in them and I'm always wrong at the end. Of course, they always do something to try to throw you off, but that's one of my favorite things. I love to watch a good movie that will keep me guessing and, and the ones that make you have to pay full attention to 
I love that. So mm -hmm. yeah, well, thank you all for sharing that. Okay, so we will move on. Let's look at relationships, the R in the PERMA model. All right. Relationships encompasses all the various interactions we have with one another. In the PERMA model, relationships refer to feeling supported, loved, and valued by others. Relationships in this model is based on the idea that humans are inherently social beings and social connections become important as we age. Research has shown that sharing good news or celebrating success fosters strong bonds and better relationships. And responding enthusiastically to others, particularly in close or intimate relationships, increases intimacy, well being, and satisfaction. According to the Pew Research Center, one third of adults ages 18 to 29 in the US were facing high distress levels due to social isolation during the beginning of the pandemic. Those numbers more than likely doubled at the height of the pandemic as the weeks and months of isolation became longer. All right. So let's look at some tips for building and sustaining relationships. The first one we want to look at is thinking strategically. Relationships are an investment of time and energy. So we know that we can't just really say, okay, I'm, I'm in a relationship or I'm in a friendship. I have a friend. And even in those friend relationships, you still have to invest that time and energy. Uh, we can't just assume that um, the relationship or the friendship is just going to be there without us interacting in some sort of way. The second one is make time to ask questions and listen. Build time in your schedule to meet potential friends. Um, we don't want to necessarily, once again, um, make the assumption that the relationship is still going to be there and be strong. Um, if we're not making time for one another, we do want to get in there and, and try to find out about people. And even when there are some potential friends that um, we would like to have a more, you know, a stronger friendship with, or just someone that may be um, just an acquaintance now, but you like their personality um, you guys like to do some of the same things and you say, okay, this may be somebody that I can see as a good friend or someone. So you want to do some questioning. You want to find out more about them. See if you guys do have something, you know, in common or whatever it is. But those are just some things that we can do. We know number three is be persistent. You can't just kind of say, okay, um, that didn't work out. So I'm not going to try anymore. Um, if there are scheduling conflicts, we have to be intentional about finding times to reschedule an event or just an outing, whatever it is we schedule, um, just being uh, positive and being intentional about finding those times to reschedule. Number four, we want to communicate regularly. We want to get in touch with people we haven't spoken to or connected with in a while. Um, I have a childhood friend, actually a friend that I went to high school with. She was my best friend. And I don't know about any of you guys, but this particular friend, for some reason or another, we kind of lost contact after we graduated um, high school and then went our separate ways, of course, with college and different things. And I think I did not, you know, kind of reestablish that relationship with her uh, until later on, maybe 10 or 15 years after we had been out of high school. And we actually had a conversation about that. What was that like for her and for myself is one of the main things that we kind of talked about. And so it was, you know, we even asked ourselves, how did we get here? How did we go from being best friends to not hardly even staying in touch. But we know, of course, just the distance between us, the physical distance. We were going to different um, colleges in different cities. So that made a big difference. But even in that day-to-day, -day, we, we found ways 
or we're finding ways now to stay connected um, and just rebuild and reestablish that relationship that we once had. And finally, identify small short-term projects of mutual interest, like going to dinner or to a park or like taking a hike together. Um, just some of those things that we like to be fully engaged in. We can find friends or potential friends and acquaintances that might like to do that. And this kind of goes together with some of the things that we're going to talk about next, but even joining uh, groups or community organizations is also a way to kind of build a friendship as well. Um, yeah, so we will move on. And Lizzie, if you have anything that may have came in or anything. Nothing. Okay, All good. All right. just checking, just checking. All right, so we're going to the M in the PERMA model, which is meaning. And it says, the search for meaning and the need to have a sense of value and worth is another innate human quality. Having a sense of belonging and or serving something greater than ourselves gives us purpose and helps us focus on what is really important when facing a significant challenge or adversity. Meaning looks different for everyone and may be pursued through a profession, a social or political cause, a creative endeavor or a religious spiritual belief, um, volunteering, extracurricular activities and or just community involvement. A sense of meaning is guided by personal values and people who report having a purpose in life live longer and have greater life satisfaction. That's according to one of the research studies that was done um, back in 2009 on positive psychology. All right, let's look at ways to build meaning in your life. Get involved in a cause or an organization that matters to you. Um, try new and different activities to see what you like. Think about how you can use your passions to help someone else or others. And of course, spending time with people you care about. All right. Let's move on to the A in the PERMA model, which is accomplishment and or achievements. All right. So accomplishment in this model is also known as achievement, mastery, or competence. A sense of accomplishment is a result of working toward and reaching goals, mastering an endeavor, and having self-motivation to finish what you set out to do. This contributes to well-being because individuals can look at their lives with a sense of pride and accomplishment. Accomplishment includes the concepts of perseverance and having a passion to obtain goals, but flourishing and well-being can come when accomplishment is tied to striving towards things with an internal motivation or working towards something just for the sake of the pursuit and improvement. Achieving intrinsic goals like growth and connection leads to larger gains in well-being than external goals such as money or fame. And so some ways to track. And I'm going to pause. Um, Lizzie, I think I see I can answer this. Sorry, we do have a question. That's okay. That's in a different window. Um, I think I know logically I have accomplishments, but how can I feel more accomplished? Okay, great question. And just in time <laughs> for us to, to kind of go through um, what I like to do. Um, and I hope this is helpful for you as well. But these ways to chat, attract, I'm sorry, ways to track accomplishments and uh, achievements. Uh, the very first one is a very important one. And I don't know um, if you've tried this before, but setting SMART goals is one of the best ways that you can kind of notice what you've done and where you're going. And of course, those goals are specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and time bound. And so for an example, um, there is a worksheet. I think we have that available. 
Um, and if you want, I can have Lizzie um, send that to you. We can get that to you. But what it is, it's just almost like um, you have a goal in mind and you kind of write that top goal or that main goal um, at the top of the page. And there's like a line for that, I believe. But um, when you're setting those uh, specific measurable pieces, what I like to do is I want to think of those as like some subtitles. You take those, um, if you have a specific goal, you can break that down into many goals and say for uh, the seven day or five day work week, I want to do this one thing that would help me uh, to gain, you know, a little bit more leverage or, you know, something towards that main goal. If I can set, you know, if I need to make a phone call or if I need to do some research on a specific thing that will affect um, the overall goal, let me set that as a goal for this week. If I spend two hours doing that, um, those are things that you want to look at that, that's kind of measurable. And you can break those measurable things down, like I said, into those sub, sub areas of maybe a monthly goal or weekly um, what you want to try to do to, to affect that overall goal. Um, so that's one of my biggest ones that I like to try to use because you can see, you can track that progress. And uh, when you get to the end of it, after you've done that and it's taking you to your major goal, uh, you can feel that sense of achievement, you know, or accomplishment. Think about it like this. For example, uh, and I'm sorry, guys, I'm throwing my whole life, not my whole life, but I'm throwing a lot of stuff out uh, about myself. And I can only use that as, a, as an example. Uh, so one of the things that was really important for me is as I was going, as I started grad school um, and started having a family, I had to stop, um, you know, take a pause. And so I didn't realize that that pause would be 11 years. So I started the grad program, um, but with that 11 year pause, trying to come back was not easy. If you can imagine just being out of school for that long and then being trying to be in a master's program <laughs> uh, was almost unachievable. But what I did is I set that overall goal of, of you know, graduating with my master's degree, not necessarily putting that off. So what my SMART goal looked like for that was, is I broke it down by semesters. And so I looked at how many, you know, hours I needed, how many classes I needed to take. Within those classes, I even broke it down a little bit further. And I kind of looked at, you know, my syllabus at the time and figured out what I needed to have done. I have this much time, this much time for the family. Um, so that's how I was able to set my SMART goals. And when I finally finished, when I walked across that stage, that was one of the best things um, that I felt like I could really do uh, that, I, that I ever done because it took me so long to get back to it. And on top of that, it took me four years just to finish um, that three-year program, but that was okay. So when I did all of that, I immediately went to step number three, and that was finding a way to celebrate myself. So when I graduated, I took myself on a cruise. Well, actually, my husband took me, but um, we went on a cruise just to celebrate uh, me, uh, you know, attaining that accomplishment. And it was one of the greatest accomplishments that I consider of my life. So I'm very proud of that, just to be able to go back um, so I hope that I hope that was uh, I hope that helps you as far as when you're thinking about seeing those accomplishments and achievements. Any other questions? No other questions, but we do have a comment. Okay. I'm learning to celebrate my achievements. Absolutely, that's great. That's great. That is great. And I do want to say one other thing about that. Uh, definitely, um, 
celebrate even the small things when it does not even seem like it's something worth celebrating. And that celebrating can just look like uh, treating yourself um, to something sweet or to ice cream, whatever it is that makes you feel good. And you can just celebrate yourself in a small personal way that means something to you. Um, I think when it comes to positive psychology, that's one of the things that I really had to learn to do is celebrate myself and celebrate the small victories. Um, and those are, they always kind of seem to go unnoticed to others, but we have to make it a point, just like we have to be intentional about what we say. Um, we have to make it a point and be intentional about celebrating ourselves. All right, guys, well, that is pretty much the end of the presentation. If we have any further questions or comments, um, the floor is open and yeah, I can answer any further questions. Awesome, thank you, Kimberly. Um, while we get those questions going, I just wanted to remind everybody that we do have free um, counsel, uh, three free consultations for counseling through the end of Saturday. And I'm going to go ahead and put that link in the chat here for you. Um, couples counseling, family, or individual with one of our um, therapists at the Center for Relationships. We do still have some um, openings for that. And we have free webinars through Saturday. So since you are here in Zoom events, feel free to add any of the upcoming webinars to your agenda so you don't forget. And yeah, no, oh, here's a question, good. Um, how, do, how does a positive psychology approach change your counseling practice? Is it similar to a pro-symptom approach or how is it different? Well, I would say um, it's not, well, in a sense, I would say it is a little bit different. Um, we st I still deal with the things that are there in the room. It's not that I, you know, neglect it. If I have a person that I am dealing, that is dealing with um, some depression or depressive symptoms at the time, we do address that. Um, what I try to do, um, and I'm hoping that this is answering your question, but what I try to do is I do try to focus on, you know, that moment. I bring them back to the present, to that day. Um, we do talk about um, maybe some of the things that went on, if there's something in the past, but I try not to let them stay in that past moment or whatever it is that, that may be affecting them in a way that's not um, helpful or healthy um, or conducive for their overall mental health. Uh, we do talk about those things, but before we leave the session, I try to um, you know, get them to talk about something that they can do. If it's just one thing, tell me something about you know, what you're grateful for you know, when you think about today, um, tell me something you've learned that you feel like can help you um, before you leave, you know, something to that effect is what I usually try to um, get um, my clients to think about when it comes to positive psychology. Awesome. Well, any last questions, you guys? The floor is yours. Uh, we want to thank everyone for attending. Thank you. Um, uh, we have a comment here. Uh, because when individuals are deep in the darkness of depression, positive psychology seems almost impossible. Yeah, it does. It does. Um, I would say if you have training uh, as far as, you know, dealing, not dealing with, I'm so sorry, uh, working with uh, clients who um, are, you know, dealing with depression or depressive symptoms, 
I do think that you have to start with that. You know, you do want to do the practical. Um, and I do want to just kind of say this. My, my, the totality of my um, way of doing counseling is not totally positive psychology. For the purpose of this particular presentation, I do want to share with you that a, a part of that is usually a part of my, my sessions because myself, <laughs> I try to be, you know, more of a positive person. So it kind of comes out in every session, but it is very hard. You are correct. Um, and it is something that you definitely have to, you know, take time with a person in work because it won't happen overnight it won't happen first session or even the second session but I think in time if you can drop those little nuggets um, in each session um, something will you know take place eventually um, it's not for everyone but I think that that there is you know uh, some good treatment methods as far as using positive psychology that can help uh, for the most part. Awesome. Well, last yeah. call for questions. You guys did ask some good ones tonight. Yes, very good. <laughs> very good questions. Um, don't forget, you can reach Kim. Um, her email address is on your screen there if you'd like to reach out to her about anything. And we do have webinars through Saturday, free consultations. Hopefully it gets warmer. <laughs> yeah, and if anybody uh, just wants to contact me one-on-one -on -one for more information about positive psychology or just have another question or have a comment or just want to kind of discuss, um, we can definitely do that. I'd love to hear, you know, different perspectives, um, just insight from others when it comes to uh, positive psychology and any other theory that's out there. Uh, please feel free to, to reach out to me. Um, yeah. Cool. Well, thank you so much, Kim. Yeah, um, absolutely. Appreciate your time and your expertise. And thank you, everybody, for coming. And we will see you guys tomorrow. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.